Yeah, so I'm going to talk about compiling JavaScript ahead of time. Uh, I'm the creator of Pawful, which you'll see shortly. I'm also the co-chair of WinterCG, which is working on standardizing runtimes like uh, like Node.js or Dino across those runtimes instead of making code with just their APIs, which doesn't work across them. I'm also an invited expert for TC39, which is improving the language because they actually specify and make the spec for it. So how JavaScript is actually run in the engine, traditionally it's with interpretation. Like the most famous example of this currently is QuickJS, which is a relatively niche engine, but it's used in various things, especially where you have resource constraints, where you can't do a just-in-time compiler, which is what engines like V8 or JavaScript Core are famous for, where they compile JavaScript source code into machine code like as it's running, because they collect they collect data on the JS as it's running to make optimized machine code, which is very really good for performance. But there is a downside of that, which is you have to compile that code on the user's machine. It's not as if you're writing, say, C++ and just shipping a binary to your users. So the problem is the longer you take to compile, it runs faster, but then also you have that initial loading time which is why most JS engines nowadays have multiple JITs, <laughs> where there will be one there will be one which is really fast to compile, but is pretty slow. And then there's one which is slow to compile, which is only run once it gets warmed up, which is where well, you've probably heard that terminology before, which is the more code gets ran, the more it will be optimized in the background. And the other concern is security, which can be not great. <laughs> Many JS engine security vulnerabilities uh, via JITs or some of the optimizations they do. So ahead of time compilation is where other languages, say C++ or Rust, you give it to a tool like on your machine or the developer's machine ahead of time. And then that makes a binary, whether it's native or WebAssembly, which you're shipping over a website. This fixes those trade-offs I talked about where you're not worried about a long compile time because that's on the developer's machine, not the user's. And security is not a concern because if you compile to say WebAssembly, that is sandboxed, you can control all the input and output from it rather than say native binaries or just-in-time compiling where that's just machine code and you have no control over it. <laughs> you can try and sandbox it, but you'll only get so far. <laughs> so you might be wondering, does something exist like this for JavaScript? And the answer is Pawful, which I make and I'm here to talk about. <laughs> and I will now do a live demo of it. So say so you have a basic hello world. Oh. You might know a little bit, but yeah. Can everyone see that? Cool. So, so you just have a basic hello world binary. So you could run this with, say, Node.js, and it works as expected. Or you can run this with Pawl4, which acts, oh, I'm too used to Linux, which acts just the same. But then you can say, compile it to a native binary, which after it takes a second, behaves just the same. But it's a native binary and it's only 44 kilobytes <laughs> versus some runtimes let you do this today, but they just bundle their entire runtime because they don't do ahead of time compiling. And that ends up being more like 90 megabytes, which is not great <laughs> for storage constraints. Additionally, yeah, yeah. That's like, oh, my slide's another right order. But yeah, so you can do anything you could usually do in like a JS REPL where you can just do Anything I used to like say promises. They just work. So it has a small event loop where you can just do promises or say date. Oh, <laughs> oh. promises are still a work in progress. <laughs> I will disclaim, but yeah, so say date or even not nice, uh, 
JavaScript like type collision. Like, so you have this. Oh. Yeah, so you can even, so as you can see, when it does the string minus one, that turns into nan because that's not a number. <laughs> but it even has those like dynamic type conversions, which JavaScript is infamous for. <laughs> or, yeah, or anything like that. So yeah. The architecture to briefly dive into it at an oversimplified level, it just takes in JavaScript source code, gives that to a parser, which I don't make because <laughs> I don't want to deal with parsing JS, <laughs> and then turns out to WebAssembly. A less simplified view is you take that WebAssembly and have an optimizer and other built ins which are written in TypeScript, and then those are compiled ahead of time as well to have a hopefully small compile cost. Then you can also optionally take that WebAssembly code and compile it to C, then also compile that to native to something like Clang or GCC. A undersimplified view, <laughs> you can see the bulk of this is optimization, which is a big goal for the project. Even getting something as fast as today's JS engines ahead of time is hard. So I try and have multiple approaches and you can kind of pick and choose what works best for your project rather than just having one bulk massive optimizer. Yeah, so test 262 is the, I guess, industry standard test suite, which is officially made by the people who make the JS specification, where it has every single feature in the language which is tested against. And I currently pass over 50% of that, which is pretty nice. And yeah, you can see the correlation is funding because <laughs> For about a year, this was a project I was doing in my free time, and then I got funding to work on it full time. And you can see the correlation of <laughs> actually having the funding to do something. And yeah, another bonus is that tiny native compilation. This is something like Dino or Bun, which just, which just bundled their entire runtime. And yeah, you can also take in TypeScript as the native input. Like, uh, if I go back to this demo, if you do dash T, oh. Then you could say do let a number equals two, and you can just give it TypeScript source code. You don't need Babel or any transpiler. And yeah, that is nice for optimization sometimes, but you can also infer types, which can sometimes work well and sometimes be more troubling. Like to go deeper into it, if you look at the actual WebAssembly outputted by the compiler. Say you just do, oh, <laughs> our system won't work because I made the optimizer too smart. <laughs> but if you say do this, maybe it won't work. <laughs> yeah, so since I made these slides, I updated my optimizer for actually optimize this. But essentially, if you do say in node, let a equals one and let b equals two. If you don't infer types, you will have no idea what a or b are. But once you infer them, you can know that and just do like an integer addition for that instruction. Instead of being like, oh, are any of these strings? I have to check that entire string concatenation. Yeah, so the timeline for this, right now it's, I would still say like pre-alpha, in which you can use it, but I have disclaimers everywhere saying <laughs> expect this not to work, but I hope next year to have it in a state where I'm comfortable people using it at an early state, where it's like I hope I hope it's at least now promising where you can see the potential of like a new approach to compiling JavaScript. So yes, uh, I can if people want to shout something, I can try and run it. <laughs> How would I go about running this? Okay, so a <laughs> thing I didn't touch upon is this is written in JavaScript. So you can just npm install. Yeah, and then you can just run it. <laughs> How would something like a input output look? 
Yeah, so right now that's one of the constraints of the... Yeah, so currently I don't have like async IO or anything because the event loop is really primitive to just get promises working basically. But it is definitely possible in WebAssembly. It's just like a matter of time, <laughs> essentially. It's just like I haven't... I'm focusing on the core engine rather than runtimey stuff. But it's definitely possible. So, you know, in terms of, say, in the Unix world of piping something into a... Say you've compiled something into a native compiler, at the moment you can't read from standard in or... Yeah, so you can, but, like, you, you can't stream it. You have to, like, sync read and write currently. Okay. What's, like, the coolest project you think could use this? Yeah, so there's a bunch of use cases I never even considered starting it. Especially, say, like, you're a company hosting JavaScript, in theory, because ahead-of-time compiling is much more efficient because you have the source code and you can optimize it then. You could, in theory, have, like, 10 times less overhead because instead of running a full runtime for every customer's project, if you ran it with this, in theory, you can just run, like, 10 times as many customers on the same server with the same hardware. So where, where are your pause failures currently? Because it looked like it was almost zero. So it's kind of like, what, what, what little corner of JavaScript are those pause failures coming from? But I guess also the big question is, like, in terms of the test failures, is, is there a particular chunk of functionality that you've yet to get to? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the main thing right now is uh, internationalization. Oh, yeah. All those APIs I have basically never touched yet, which is probably like 20%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that chunk is mostly, it's mostly features I haven't gone around to, and they cause some trip up. Like, uh, I think there's some await things, because promises are still relatively new and unstable. So there's some things where, like, if you have like a hundred concurrent promises, you can have some like memory issues or something. So with, with the compile errors then, is that await stuff or is it is some other syntax that you're... Yeah, it, it, it's actual await. Like you right. can do like await oh, this. Yeah. Oh, if it's a module, <laughs> JavaScript. But yeah, you can do like this, but then if you do, uh, I forgot the proper syntax, but if you like force it to be pending, you can see the await doesn't do anything. It just right. returns the promise. So yeah, there's some stuff where, like it won't await fully properly because it, it's like a primitive event loop for now. <laughs> is there a particular actually someone else? Could <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular JavaScript feature worried about coming from the pipeline? That's yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. Away? The main thing is eval, which I'm not worried about. It will be, basically, for now, I don't plan to support it because I, at least I hope people have learned by now that it's not good. You just say strict mode by default, right? Yeah, essentially. But like, 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 say right now, if you do uh, eval one, it will work, but this is only because it reads that this is like a string literal. So if you do like, let's sort of say eval is not defined <laughs> because it, in theory, because it's written in JavaScript, it could compile itself and then use that for eval. But for now, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> because I, I guess, at least for now, I'm not focusing on, say you have like a 20-year-old JavaScript code base and you want it to just magically run with this. For now, I'm more targeting it's the same language. Because there's been some stuff for like assembly script, where it's like a subset of TypeScript which is very cool, but I wouldn't want someone to have to relearn the entire language <laughs> to use my project. Like, I'm, I'm okay with it not, not working with like a 10-year-old legacy thing because it's using eval or some really niche compat things. But I think, like if, like, if I just gave you it and you wrote something for it, it should just work. You, wouldn't have, you shouldn't have to consider the JS engine, oh, it doesn't support feature X, or like, it's really slow if you use Y. One more. <laughs> Not yet, but that's definitely a possibility. For now, I'm more targeting server-side things, but it's definitely a possibility. There is one use case which is interesting, which is like obfuscation. Like, say you have some really sensitive code, like, you know, interacting with your server or 
Or like for some reason it's sensitive. In theory, if you compile that to WebAssembly, it's much harder to deobfuscate and like see how it works because it's WebAssembly <laughs> rather than just plain text. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>